so in summary, that's me. Uh, 25 years of IT and high-tech experience, uh, working for large organizations, 12 years of overseas stints, most roles global or regional, and a very, very broad skill set encompassing technology and business roles. Uh, for the past four years, I've been doing consulting gigs as well as teaching at uh, multiple institutions like uh, I am Indore, Lucknow, Sambalpur, Bangalore. I've also taught at MICA and I'm Tika Siabat. So that's a little bit of introduction on my part. So agenda for today. First, you know, you've often heard this term digitization, digitalization or digital transformation. So we're going to demystify some of these terms right, because the changes that are happening around us are non-linear, in fact, exponential, and oftentimes we are not geared as individuals as well as business units or even organizations to address these changes. So we'll start with disruptive digitization that is happening around us. Then we'll move to the underlying shifts and drivers, the underpinnings of this massive transformation that is happening across businesses. After that, we will come down to use cases. Use cases, not only in terms of industries and businesses, but also functional areas. How is a typical finance job being disrupted by digitization? How is, what is the changing nature of marketing in present age? Uh, how are things like analytics, big data, and artificial intelligence, you know, how are they being a game changer? And then finally, we're gonna talk about the future of jobs. What does it mean for a person who is either working in the industry today or is getting ready to step into a business environment? So this is gonna be our brief agenda. We'll first run through the slides and uh, uh, I'll spend some more time on some slides than others and breeze through some slides. And then at the end of the discussion, we're gonna open up a a Q&A session. So assuming some of you are students, uh, let's look at a typical day in today's algorithm economy. It's, it's a nice phrase that we use today because I, I'm a marketer as well as a technologist and the marketer in me calls it an attention economy because information abundance and human attention are at odds to each other. Uh, the technologist in me uh, likes to call it an algorithm economy, uh, whereas let's say a job seeker in me likes to call it a gig economy because the nature of jobs are changing from permanence to short-lived roles. So let's look at your typical day and put it in the context of digitization, digitalization, or the evolving digital business environment. So let's say in the last few days, if you used a smartphone, a Siri or a Google Assistant on, on your Android or iOS device, you are using natural language processing, which involves contextual awareness and effective computing. By effective, we mean emotional awareness, right? You can do voice search or conversational search, which again includes natural language processing and a semantic understanding. By semantic, I mean, the search engines not only understand your intent, but also the implied intent of your query. If you used an Uber or a Dunzo, you know, the Uber algorithm did route optimization to optimize for travel time or fuel time using artificial intelligence. The pricing was dynamic based on demand and supply. And in fact, in a digital environment, you can even do price discrimination, which means that you charge different prices to different people for the same products and services at the same time. If you retrieved docs from Google Cloud, right, you are witnessing the massive IT migration which is happening from captive data centers to public or hybrid cloud environments. If you did an organic search on Google, looking for something, you know, you, you were served search results based on an algorithm which takes more than 200 factors into account. If you were looking for a new pair of glasses and you went to LensCart, 
and did a virtual try on obviously you used a technology called augmented reality then maybe you were on facebook or insta or even snapchat and let's say the news feed algorithm of facebook takes as many as 100000 factors into account before deciding what to serve you and if you were let's say posting a photograph of yourself with your friends the facebook deep face facial algorithm right uses again neural networks or deep learning to tag your friends and then if you are doing general browsing on the web and you found a little spooky behavior that you were seeing ads that were literally following you on facebook based on your previous browsing history or behavior you know you are using something called ad tech or advertisement technology similarly the display ads that you see the sales offers that you get in your email inbox or served to advertisements are hyper personalized using programmatic media advertising and in fact in a while we will look at the entire consumer decision journey and figure out how it has been totally transformed with the use of analytics machine learning and deep learning or for that matter if you use a service like fresh menu probably you got a cash back 25 bucks 35 bucks well so probably fresh menu did a churn analysis to figure out that okay you naturally order from fresh menu on the weekends and you know you're likely to churn to let's say zomato or swiggy so they give you a a cash back offer as an inducement for that matter if you renewed the two wheeler insurance policy uh uh for for your vehicle uh the risk the premium was done using risk underwriting that again involved algorithms uh your match on tinder uh if you booked an airline ticket again the pricing algorithm is fairly complex something known as yield management systems so why we are discussing this is that it's nothing new you're already in that age in today's economy you interact with data analytics algorithms that use machine learning deep learning or whatever you want to call it cognitive computing on a daily basis okay and this change is very very rapid it is impacting the survival of the future of industries businesses uh business units and even affecting individuals when it comes to their preparedness for jobs of the future so now let's look at the underlying drivers what's what's what are the key technologies uh, which are fueling this massive change uh, data today is being generated at a torrid pace you know you have sensors you know today's if you look at the velocity of data generation today uh, it is absolutely mammoth and also you have multi dimensional data not only structured data but also semi structured or unstructured data in terms of text images uh video speech etc etc and then we are looking at emergence of web 3.0 uh, over from web 2.0 which is about interactivity iot is industrial iot or internet of things is taking off in a big way i think if i recall the number right we are looking at somewhere between 50 to 75 billion connected devices by end of 2020 ai analytics machine learning deep learning rpa robotic process automation is totally transforming you know those the business the businesses of yester years like those back office businesses or bpos have been transformed if not decimated by the advent of robotic process automation similarly when it comes to it the shift to cloud emergence of technologies like augmented reality mixed reality virtual reality a surgeon in tomorrow's operating room could use augmented reality you know while performing complex robotic surgery on you cyber security and encryption whenever there is going to be a data there is always going to be hacking or breach of data or malicious use of data so cyber security and encryption are big wearables are taking off all kinds of wearables which are about the quantified self the concept of quantified self is data about yourself you know in trivial terms how many hours you sleep how many calories you consume 
what are your different modes and then blockchain which is a decentralized distributed ledger is transforming with massive applications in areas for example like in finance 3d printing also called additive manufacturing though different from mass manufacturing has very strong use cases and today we are looking at autonomous driving or self driving cars which literally incorporate all the technologies like cloud and iot and and image recognition etc cetera, etc cetera. and if you've probably heard of quantum computing recently you may have heard that uh, i'm sorry let's just go back yeah you may have heard that uh, google achieved a feat recently with quantum computing and then you know our our biggest paranoia are our jobs going to be taken away by the advent of ai today we are talking about narrow ai specific use cases but let's say 2040 or 2045 we are talking about the emergence of general ai which is about basically simulating all the human like capabilities problem solving critical thinking reasoning ethical judgment etc etc and uh, this is one field which is gaining widespread attention um, you know because of very very disruptive use cases across industries in fact a couple of days ago i was reading a report that as many as uh, 40% of jobs in the us are at risk uh, of either being displaced or being marginalized or you know augmented uh, with artificial intelligence so you have this robotics humanoid non humanoid robots uh, aerial and underwater robots uh, sometimes they are known as drones or unmanned aerial vehicles so all these underlying technologies you know if you look at them in isolation they look like one technology making a certain kind of impact but when you put them together because they all have a play into each other when you put them together then the change is mammoth the change is exponential and the change is usually beyond human comprehension in terms of you know our individual readiness to respond to that so uh, let's kind of switch back to uh, the business landscape uh, the the disruption in industry structure and order can we mute that conversation please right so let's look at uh, let's kind of classify businesses uh, across three categories today first you have tech entrepreneurs or the digital natives you know these guys do not have any liability of yester years they are like generation z or z of today that were born uh, between let's say 1995 to 2010 they are comfortable with technologies they don't have the liability of incumbency uh, they are born in the digital age they are companies like uber or you know your swiggy or zomato or tesla etc etc and these guys are are a major threat to industry incumbents that you see in the middle and the incumbents are the guys who are not digital natives so let's call them instead of generation z maybe you can call them uh, the millennials or for that matter even generation y or baby boomers right so these industry incumbents are under threat and unless they pivot unless they transform themselves unless they rearchitect everything about themselves they are not going to be competitive with tech entrepreneurs who are attacking them uh, frontal attacks flanking attacks from a competitive standpoint and then there are the giants the third category these are businesses like fang uh, facebook amazon apple netflix google or the ibms of the world which have technology to the core of their operations but even they are being massively disrupted because even if you look for look at a pure tech company like IBM IBM as an organization has undergone massive uh, transformations from the mainframe era to the services era and then now you would have Jenny Rometty talking about big bets on cognitive uh, you know pouring a uh, billion dollars behind Watson for cognitive computing which is about uh, artificial intelligence so uh, understand that there is a major disruption happening in the industry and no businesses uh, that are a part of this industry have been spared uh, uh, and with that 
So I also want to uh, demystify some of these terms because we use them pretty commonly without understanding what's going on around us. So when we use the words digitization or digitalization, uh, I'm referring to digitization or digitalization of products, uh, a, an organization services, how a customer experience is delivered, how are the internal business processes being architected or redefined, uh, what are the new age business models? For example, you know, an eBay today makes money through transaction fee, they make money through listing fee, uh, they make money through digital advertisement. So all these new business models have been enabled or they've been made feasible because of the rise of the digital age, their go-to-market strategy and the firm value chains, both upstream and downstream in terms of distribution, uh, and the other side being supply chain, we talk about digitization of supply chains, a lot of applications of AI and machine learning um, appearing in, in those environments. So a unique thing about these digital businesses is that they use a platform business model. And in the following slide, I'm gonna give you a lot of examples to help you understand, you know, some real life businesses that have evolved from products or services to platforms. And these businesses basically thrive on ecosystems because there are multiple uh, players on a platform and on a platform you have direct effects, indirect network effects, uh, right? So one key change that is happening in the industry is the rise of coopetition. Coopetition is, you know, there are no clear boundaries between competitors and partners. You know, your competitors partner with you and your partners compete with you. So competition is no longer a zero sum game, you know, like a, like a winner or a loser or like an adversary. So this adversarial positions in the industry are changing to competition and platforms thrive on participation and orchestration. Meaning that, let's say if you have an iOS platform, Apple is the orchestrator. Think of Apple as a puppet master uh, who is moving all the puppets, and then there are different players, the app developers, uh, you know, you know, books on the uh, books, music, uh, movies on the Apple platform. There are different players or participants on the platform, and all of these participants bring shared value. So you're talking about capability co-creation uh, in these models. Also, the changing nature of innovation, because as an organization has to be agile. Innovation has to be built into the culture of the organization, which means that you're always testing, learning, failing, iterating all the times to respond to a very fast pace of change that is happening around you. you in other words, you just can't be complacent. And then finally, we talk about when we come to the most important thing, you know, the future of humans and human talent, Today we are looking at augmentation, which is increasing your capability through technologies like data science or artificial intelligence and amplifying your own abilities. And obviously we all know of those doomsday scenarios uh, that people predict in let's say 20, 40 or 45, uh, where a very wide number of jobs which are being done by humans uh, will be better delivered to robots or their underlying technologies. So it's not all doom and gloom. Uh, I do want to point it out, uh, but there's massive change. It's not like that jobs are going away. It's not like that humans are being redundant. Uh, but then if I can put it in a nutshell, you know, humans will possibly focus on their own distinctive capabilities like negotiation or um, you know, problem solving or critical thinking or analysis. Where a, whereas a lot of lower value add or a lower order kind of jobs will be relegated to technologies or uh, robots, bots as you call them. So uh, in the last slide, I mentioned about this emergence of platforms. So look at this slide, uh, technology platforms, Amazon Web Services, Azure, Predix, uh, they're all technology platforms. We interact with computing platforms on a daily basis, iOS, Android, you have Alexa as a platform. Uh, in fact, uh, pretty interesting history of Alexa because Amazon failed to make a foray into mobile phones. You're probably aware of that disaster or that fiasco that they had with, uh, I believe the phone was called Fire or something. But they had this wonderful technology 
uh, through a company that they bought, uh, uh, you know, that used, uh, that is the present day Alexa. And Alexa is a platform because literally third parties can write skills for Alexa. And the more skills there are on Alexa, the more potent or capable the platform is. Then we deal with utility platforms like Google Search or Google Maps uh, pretty much on a daily basis. For example, to commute, uh, we use interaction networks like Facebook, WhatsApp, PayPal, marketplaces, uh, e-commerce or net marketplaces, whatever you want to call it, companies like eBay or Airbnb, which is, if you look at Airbnb's valuation today, probably it's only second to the biggest hotel chain in the world. It's a major threat in terms of business model uh, to established companies like the Intercontinental Hotels Group or all these big names that are here all the time, like Marriott's in the world. And then Amazon, obviously. Amazon is, well, so only 9% of um, sales uh, in a country like e-commerce are online. And in India, it's actually even lower. I, don't remember exactly probably three to four percent of total retail sales are online but but this is growing at a very very fast clip or if you look at kickstarter which is a very novel way to raise funding for businesses a non-traditional way on-demand platforms like uber lyft crowdsourcing platforms like youtube the techies and you would have heard of stack overflow where you can collaborate for solving wicked technical problems and then data harvesting platforms like Waze, which is basically a navigation app that was acquired by Google, um, which uses data in a pretty interesting way. So the transition of businesses, so probably by now you've figured out, you know, all these underlying technologies that are fueling this massive transformation in the industry landscapes. Uh, not only are industries changing, businesses changing, also the present avatars or the nature of present roles is changing. So the marketing of today or finance of today is dramatically different from let's say the same function that existed five years ago. And probably in the end of it, we can probably talk about why we are talking about it. And the reference point there is that uh, at IFI, we have totally, our, our curriculum is never defined. It's always in a state of flux because it is always aligned to the changing nature of industries and the jobs out there. Sorry for this uh, a little uh, uh, going back. Uh, let me just come back to the present slide. So uh, that's a summary of it. Now what's happening is that uh, when it comes to businesses, uh, people or businesses that play bold uh, will generate a much greater return on investment uh, when it comes to these digital technologies. And uh, there are people, there are companies that will just try to protect their turf, protect their core. There are companies that will make big, bold moves. Uh, they'll have a much bigger payoff. But let's say by 2025, we're talking that almost a third of total global sales will come from ecosystems, the kind of companies that we just discussed. And this share is uh, continuously growing and 30% of the global economy will be integrated network economy and the remaining 68% traditional economy. So even economies are in a state of flux. So now let's look at uh, underlying shifts and drivers of digital transformation. Um, uh, this, is, uh, uh, this has references to a very nice book on digital transformation by uh, Dr. David Rogers of Columbia. And we look at some, some of the changing paradigms which are fueling this transformation, the, fundamental, the fundamentals of the market, customer competition, data, innovation, and value. Let's unpack them one by one. So starting with customers. So if you look at customers of today, let's look at 10 years ago, brands would talk and customers would listen. And if you look at the present age, you know, brands don't talk, they do and customers talk. They talk about the actual behavior of brands. So basically the balance of power is shifting from firms to consumers and, and consumers or customers are no longer passive targets. They are basically dynamic networks. So now we don't talk of customers as a monolithic mass market. We talk about segment of one. We talk about micro segments 
or even segment of one, which is possible in the digital world. So customers are essentially nodes in a network and communications in the earlier model were broadcast to networks. Uh, but now communications are two way. And not only that, customers hold the upper hand when it comes to driving the polarity of conversation, the volume of conversation. You know, we're talking about the talkability and relatability of a brand. Earlier model, firm was a key influencer. They dictated what customers thought of them. They controlled the customer experience. Here, customers are the key influencer. In the earlier model, you know, marketing was designed to, you know, it was a very overt selling kind of a or kind of an orientation designed to persuade a purchase. Whereas today we are talking about marketing that creates wonderful experiences, inspirational moments that build loyalty and advocacy and builds iconic brands like Harley Davidson or Apple for that matter. So naturally in a network economy, you know, you're talking about reciprocal value flows as opposed to one way value flows. And in a typical um, production environment, we talk about, you know, efficiencies or economies of scale and scope. And we're talking about economies of firm scale, but now we talk about economies of customer value. And this word value is pretty interesting because customer value itself is not static. It is always being redefined. It is always, it is, it is kind of a moving uh, ground all the time or a moving target. Competition, let's look at competition. From symmetric to asymmetric, and as we discussed, from products to platforms. And platforms integrate both products and services. So let's kind of unpack this term called asymmetric competition. Uh, Honda and a Toyota are basically symmetric competitors. If you look at the classical model, but let's say a Toyota or a Honda is an asymmetric competitor to Uber or Lyft or Ola because both of them are serving the underlying need of commuting or transportation. So in the earlier model, competition was very clearly defined and demarketed. Whereas in the present age, competition is very fluid. Uh, there was a clear distinction between partners and rivals, friends and foes. But now, you know, we use this term called frenemy. You're, you're, you're a friend as well as an enemy because the distinction between the partner and the rival has blurred. And the earlier model, when you were a clear adversary, it was a zero sum game, meaning there was a winner or a loser but now you talk about competitors that cooperate in key areas. An example is, let's say Apple and Samsung. You know, Apple has taken uh, Samsung to court multiple times uh, for patent uh, violations, and they've been awarded uh, punitive damages, uh, I believe, multiple times. But at the same time, it is uh, Samsung that supplies LCD panels for your iPhones. Uh, the memory or the RAM also comes from Samsung. So while they are competing fiercely, they're also cooperating at the same time. And since we are now talking about platforms and ecosystems, the key assets earlier would be held inside the firm, but in a network economy, it's, it's basically the strength of your network. And obviously we're moving from products with unique features and benefits uh, to platforms where partners do co-creation of value. And in the earlier model, you know, you would have these few dominant competitors per category. It depends on the nature of the industry and the nature of the products you're talking about. It could be fragmented, it could be a monopoly, duopoly, uh, whatever. But in the digital age, uh, you have these winner takes all due to network effects. Now that you have Facebook with uh, 2 billion plus uh, subscribers, it's very difficult for another Facebook to emerge because uh, you know, you had this Instagram that was acquired by Facebook, I believe in 2012 for a billion dollars uh, for their uh, growth. So, you know, these big giants, they are consolidating all the time and they kind of take all the booty home. Data. Uh, data. The problem with data is that data is extremely uh, valuable, but uh, prior to the digital age, data used to reside in silos and each business unit would act as a custodian of their own data. And they didn't have a single 360 degree integrated cohesive view of data that, that they could leverage 
uh, across organization with customer at the center. Uh, earlier model data was extensive. Uh, now it is continuously generated. And actually, if you look at uh, things like deep learning, what is enabled deep learning today is that not only do you have data being generated at a very torrid pace, but also you have multi-dimensional data, structured, semi-structured, unstructured, text, audio, video, speech, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, challenge of data has moved from storing, managing, parsing it to actually extracting meaningful insights out of that. Uh, earlier model, uh, only structured data that would fit neatly into your rows and tables and your RDBMSs, database systems was valuable. But now predominantly most of the data is unstructured like video or audio. And that is finding increasing use and value. So, and, and, and so data is emerging as a key intangible asset for an organization. And if you look at a business like Uber or a Zomato um, or a Swiggy, which is essentially a platform, uh, their biggest asset, obviously they do have, uh, you know, other resources, for example, on the Swiggy platform, you know, they have, uh, it's, they have, let's say merchants or uh, restaurant or eateries who are preparing food because it's a platform. And at the same time, you have these ecosystem of customers on one side and then the delivery people on the other side. But if you look at their biggest asset today, uh, it is, you know, obviously all the resources that we just discussed are important when it comes to building an ecosystem and creating a platform. Uh, but data is one of their foremost assets. Innovation. Uh, earlier on in the earlier model, decisions would be made based on intuition and seniority. In fact, uh, this reminds me of Jack Welch's book, uh, Straight from the Gut. You know, Jack Welch was one of the iconic uh, CEOs of General Electric, which is a very admired company. But it's changing. You know, you we use this words called hippo. Hippo means highest paid person's opinion. Uh, in the earlier model, you know, if you were having a business meeting, the person with the biggest uh, rank or the person with the biggest paycheck would impose his or her opinion or decision on others. But in the age of data, where you can do rapid experimentations, where you can do rapid tests and validations, you know, we talk about data-driven decisions. So it's no longer hippo, the highest paid person's opinion. It is, it is basically the person who has the data to support his or her point of view. And obviously data can be manipulated, uh, you know, there are biases, it can be non-representative, but if you use data judiciously, it is the biggest truth teller of all. Earlier model, uh, pre-digital testing was slow, expensive, difficult. Now it is just the opposite. Experiments would be conducted infrequently. They now it's pretty much in, ingrained into the DNA of the organization. There are different innovation models. Uh, and now we are moving our focus from the solution to finding the right problem to solve. And failure being a taboo in, in the business environment and in certain societies and cultures uh, is basically when you're moving to an agile methodology, we talk about failing smart, failing cheap, failing fast, learning from failures, and oftentimes, uh, sometimes even celebrating failures so long as you know, we learn from our failures in a smart way and, uh, and failures lead to bigger successes down the line. So obviously in the agile model, uh, in the earlier model, uh, the waterfall model, you, you talk about a finished product or a polished rollout, whereas in the agile philosophy, we talk about rapid pivoting, uh, rapid, uh, you know, it has its own terminology, the sprints and the, and the like, but uh, you, you, the focus is on minimum viable prototypes because the environment around you is in rapid flux. So you're basically iterating and changing all the time. And this is a pretty steady process. You don't have, let's say innovation, you deeply embed innovation in the organizations and you literally make a culture out of that, right? And when it comes to value, um, earlier, you know, you would have this value proposition that was defined by industry, but now since customers are in the driver's seats, uh, they define the value proposition right? The challenge is to uncover the next opportunity for customer value. Uh, because of this rapid change, uh, optimizing your business model is no longer enough. You always have to stay ahead of the curve. And 
there is no complacency. In fact, uh, uh, earlier on in the 90s, there was a pretty popular term called sustainable competitive advantage. It, it was as if you know, a company could come up with a certain kind of advantage let it, in terms of customer value, business model, operational processes, the capital assets that it has, et cetera, et cetera. And then you would use this term called sustained or sustainable competitive advantage. But in today's world, in the digital world, there is nothing called a sustained competitive advantage. And it is even true for humans because unless humans are cons constantly upskilling and reskilling themselves, they don't have a sustained foothold in any organization. So I'm actually reminded of this Andy Grove quote, only the paranoid survive. Uh, you know, people who are always questioning their beliefs and who are never complacent, who are always agile, on the move, and responding to the environment around them, only they are successful today. So having said all this, we've laid the groundwork. So now I'll change my gears and I'll come to a little bit of tech. Uh, uh, if you look at, uh, obviously we discussed a whole slew of technologies, but if you look at the biggest game changers today, coupled with data and analytics, and then obviously moving beyond analytics, you have these greenfield areas of deep learning and cognitive computing, right? Which is basically creating uh, human-like abilities uh, and in, with technology, which are unlocking significant business and economic value. In fact, I was reading a McKinsey report a couple of days ago, which talk about the potential economic impact of analytics plus machine learning plus deep learning at somewhere like $15 trillion and deep learning alone out of those $15 trillion was 40% of that, uh, you know, something like uh, uh, maybe $6 trillion. So we're unlocking significant value out of these technologies. Uh, I will not go deep into analytics, but then you have these predictive, descriptive and prescriptive analytics, uh, which talk about, uh, let's say we are moving from information to optimization, from hindsight to insight to foresight. Uh, I'll breeze through some of these slides because I think we still have a lot of ground to cover. So I don't want to get uh, us mired into technology. And then obviously you have different types of machine learning, supervised, unsupervised, uh, reinforcement learning. Uh, because of paucity of time, uh, you know, we'll probably skip that. But let's come to the business impact. So typical problems analytics can solve today. Uh, the most, the three biggest ones are classification, continuous estimation, and clustering. So classification is, you know, who is going to default on a credit card? Who is going to pay the bill on time or who's going to default? That's a classification problem. Continuous estimation. Based on all the market situation, can I predict my sales for the next quarter? That's continuous estimation. Clustering. Can I break down my entire customer base into different micro segments that exhibit different behavior for whom I can drive different promotions or even different products? Uh, and then optimization like the Uber route optimization, anomaly detection, let's say credit card fraud, somebody steals your credit card data and there is a swipe on your credit card or purchase which is inconsistent with your prior purchase history. That's anomaly detection that we encounter. Ranking is like, like your Google search results. I'm sure you're very clued on to recommendations because the majority of movies that are watched on Netflix are driven off the recommendation engine. People don't search, do it, don't do internal search on Netflix anymore. They just follow the recommendation engine. And then you have these generative, uh, uh, net, uh, generative, uh, generative adversarial networks. Today, you may have heard of AI creating music or AI creating or emulating uh, painting skills of a Mozart or a Picasso, so data generation. These are typical problems that analytics can solve, <clears throat> by no means exhaustive. Let's look at some use cases. You must be wondering, I'm a marketing guy. I'm a finance person. I work in the retail industry. I work in oil and gas. I work in manufacturing and uh, logistics. So what is the impact of that on my functional role? Uh, or what is the impact of that on my, on my industry? So let's take 
marketing, macro trends in marketing, the, the kind of marketing we do today, neuromarketing. You know, you probably have heard of this term where people are put in fMRI machines to observe their brain activity to different, let's say, offers or stimulus, uh, neuromarketing, a lot of automation in marketing today. It's not that creativity is dead. It's not that uh, typical human uh, abilities are dead, but they are now all data and automation led. So we talk about experiential marketing or data driven creativity, uh, lots of predictive analytics. In fact, uh, sales and marketing are, uh, is one functional area which is most disrupted, or in fact, let me not use this negative word called disrupted, which is most enhanced or which is most augmented uh, with the use of uh, analytics uh, and artificial intelligence. Programmatic advertising, uh, uh, pro our programmatic media is taking over, even impacting channels like TV and radio for that matter. People who are in B2B marketing would have definitely heard the word account-based marketing where let's say you try to grow the account value. If you have, let's say have a hundred million dollar account, uh, you know, how do you grow your share of wallet um, you know, from that account, so which is marketing directed at specific accounts. Uh, people in IT industries would understand it very well. Capgemini, Infosys, uh, Wipro, all of these companies have major account-based marketing setups. And there's this nice term called micro moments because when, if you look at the consumer decision journey, right, uh, we have these micro moments that nudge us along right from, let's say, brand awareness, all the point to the point of purchase and not only purchase, but actually brand evangelism and uh, advocacy. So how does a brand interact with you in those moments that matter or micro moments uh, to uh, turn you into not only a customer, but a brand advocate. And then obviously personalization is big. It is spooky at the same time because, you know, personalization involves use of data and there's severe privacy issues around it as well. Uh, which is why you know a lot of uh, you know you have gdpr in europe today and then i was reading reports about india also coming up with a data and privacy policy along the lines of gdpr uh, in europe but then data is a dual edged sword you can you can impinge on somebody's privacy at the same time you can use data anonymous data about that person to personalize your marketing um, to the you know behavior or needs or expectations of that person. Uh, I'm gonna to skip to this slide. Uh, look at the consumer decision journey there. It's pretty ma uh, messy, non-linear, lots of loops here, uh, right? Uh, but look at the consumer decision journey and you know, right from your content personalization or curation to programmatic media, to uh, propensity modeling or market mix modeling, to you know, AI-driven lead scoring or dynamic pricing, use of chatbots, predictive customer service, marketing automation, all significantly impacted through machine learning and multiple AI applications. Moving from marketing to finance, because I'm covering only two functional areas today, marketing and finance. Let's look at applications of blockchain. Blockchain, um, for those of you who haven't heard of it is a decentralized distributed ledger. And a lot of people think blockchain is about Bitcoin or Ethereum, the cryptocurrency, but blockchain is the underlying technology behind uh, cryptocurrency and it has wide ranging applications in finance, right from interbank transactions, smart contract enforcement, uh, cross-border transaction and remittances, clearing and settlement. In fact, no KYC, know your customer, in fact, in India, we've had this long-standing controversy about uh, EVM hacking during uh, elections. But if you use blockchain, then basically, you know, your entire controversy would go away because then your identity cannot be forged and uh, EVMs could be made uh, temper-proof. So lots and lots of applications, AML, anti-money anti -money laundering, your overall data security or financial inclusion, so this is just one example of only one technology and there are multiple such technologies and the impact becomes a lot more non-linear or exponential when we, they play together of how, let's say, uh, finance as a function is being disrupted 
or if you look at AI in finance, artificial intelligence, your credit decisions, smart underwriting, risk management, uh, your stock performance prediction or algorithmic trading, uh, lots of NLP powered information retrieval, uh, cybersecurity and fraud detection, AI based reporting and analysis, et cetera. So AI is uh, playing big time in finance as well. So this is, this is all this is in the context of the changing nature of roles uh, with all the digitization and digitalization that is happening around us. And I will take only a couple of minutes on this slide before I actually uh, break into my Q&A session. Let's look at uh, industry like retail because you see, I've taken a retail example because retail is a very data rich kind of a, uh, environment, especially online retail, because if you look at Amazon, it thrives on data. So let's look at analytics examples in retail. Your recommendation engine on Amazon, next product to buy, people who bought this also bought this, uses collaborative filtering. Attribution modeling. Attribution modeling is basically about understanding in your marketing campaign, which channels online plus offline are resulting into most, which are being most effective, which are resulting into most sales using, let's say we use Marco chain or Monte Carlo, we use price analytics for price optimization, uh, for marketing mix model, which is, you know, understanding what kind of marketing campaigns, pricing strategies, distribution strategies, et cetera, would result into the best business performance uses a lot of panel data. Typical example would be a CPG industry like Procter & Gamble using it. And then obviously for segmentation of customers, store and products, we discussed that we use a lot of clustering to predict your demand. You would use uh, you know, time series models, um, customer analytics, recency, recency, frequency, and monetary value, RFM analysis, survival, churn analysis, uh, to determine what is the likelihood of purchase on behalf of a single customer, a brand can build uh, a propensity model. And then obviously using association rule learning, you can do a market basket analysis to understand what you can cross sell or upsell to your customers. So I took retail as an example, but then if you were to take a different industry like manufacturing, you know, you would see similar applications of data and analytics and uh, artificial intelligence when it comes to, let's say your manufacturing because in that scenario a classification problem would change to you know a product coming off an assembly line what is ready for customer delivery makes meets your quality standards and what probably needs to go back to the line for some kind of a fix so lots and lots of applications uh, uh, across industry segments so with that uh, the future of jobs uh, uh, I come to the future of jobs because this entire presentation, the context of it is that uh, uh, the curriculum at IFIM that we've designed and developed is basically aligned to meet the present and future needs of Industry 4.0, the digital environment of the future. Uh, it's not that jobs are going away, uh, but it's only that the nature of jobs is significantly changing. So for some of you who, might, uh, who are probably prospective students uh, looking at, uh, let's say, an MBA or a B school kind of education, it's absolutely critical that you attend a B school which has a curriculum which is not of yesteryears, but is, has been re-architected, redesigned to meet the expectations that businesses have of you as you step into your professional roles. Uh, that's why we talk about uh, grooming and building T-shaped professionals ready to meet the challenges of Industry 4.0. And this is my last slide, and I would now break into a Q&A session.